it, guys. So this is a review to help you get ready for the air test that you're going to be taking in the next couple of weeks. Now, what I've done is I've taken all of the online practice test questions and I've printed them off for you so that we can go through and we can do them together. For each question, I'm going to go through and I'm going to read the question to you and review a little bit of basic information for you. And then I want you to pause the video, take the time to answer the question, and then hit play and go on to the next one. So let's start. Question number one. It says, following is a description of the geologic history of a region. A large sea covered the region, allowing coral reefs to develop. Next, the sea retreated and the region became a desert. Then, geologic stresses caused surface rocks to crack and break. And finally, the deep cracks in the surface rock allowed lava to erupt and extrude, which then quickly cooled. So we have now there a breakdown of the first four events that happened. It says the layers M, N, and O represent the positions of three rock layers found in the region. The layers have not been overturned. And if you remember, the law of superposition says that the oldest rock layers are where? On the bottom. So we know if it's not been overturned, layer O is the oldest, then N, and then M. It says select the boxes to match the geologic features or materials that will likely be found in the layers based on the region's geologic history. So what that means is you're going to take a look at the four traits or the four items that they give you. You have fault, basalt, which is a type of igneous rock. And if you remember from seventh grade science, igneous come from volcanoes. Then you have limestone and sandstone, which are both sedimentary rocks. So what you need to figure out is which of these items would be in layer M, meaning it's the most recent, layer N, meaning it's the second period, time period event, or layer O, meaning it was the oldest. And in order to answer this, again, use those four things that are up at the top there. Figure out what's the order, where should these rock layers occur, in layer M, N, or O. Take some time, answer this question, and then when you're ready, let's go on to the next one. Okay, question number two. An environmental change occurs, causing a change in the color of the snails present in an ecosystem. The graph shows the color distribution in a snail population at two different times. So anytime you're taking an air test like this, or anytime you're taking any exam and you have a graph or a chart, you really need to analyze that chart or graph before you go on and try to answer this question. So let's look. This chart is on the color distribution in a snail population. At the left-hand side, which would be our y-axis, we can see it talks about the number of individuals starting at zero and going up to many. On the bottom, the x-axis, we have the color of the snails. Lighter snails being on the left, darker snails being on the right. And then on the right-hand side, we have the legend, or the key. That dashed line, which is gray, is the population before that major change happened in the ecosystem. The blue line, the solid blue line, is the population after the change. So before we even get to the question, let's take a look. Are there more lighter snails or darker snails after the change? Hopefully you guys said that there's more darker snails. That's why that line goes up higher, because there's more individuals of the darker snail population. Now let's take a look at the question. It says select the four possible explanations for the results shown in the graph. So there's something that might have caused there to now be more darker snails. And there's four possible things that could have caused that. Take a minute to pause the video here, read those options, and check the four items that you think might have caused the darker snail population to increase. Okay, let's go on to the next part. Now this says the following question has two parts. First answer part A, then answer part B. Make sure when you're taking your air test that you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page as you answer the questions because parts A and B or parts one, two, three, they're gonna be at the bottom of the page and if you don't scroll down, you won't be able to see those questions. So part A says, instruments located around Earth record seismic wave activity during an earthquake. The epicenter of the earthquake and locations of four instrument stations around Earth are shown. So let's take a look at this diagram. It says instrument stations around Earth, and we see where the epicenter starts. It's at the bottom of the circle, or what represents the Earth. Now remember, the epicenter is the top of where an earthquake happens. That point deep down inside the Earth where the earthquake starts, do you remember what that's called? That's called the focus. 
And then we have the locations of four different seismic stations that are detecting the seismic waves. So it says which stations will record fewer waves than others? Take a minute to answer this. Is it going to be station one and four, stations two and three, stations three and four, or stations one and two? Which ones will record fewer waves, meaning not as many waves will reach them? Okay, now the second part to this question, part B, says select the two statements that explain why fewer waves were recorded at some stations. So you're going to read these and you're going to pick two that explain why there might have been fewer waves. Now let's review a little bit. Remember, in seismic waves, you have P waves, which are your primary waves, and you have S waves, which are your secondary waves. P kind of sounds like the letter B, which means both. P waves can go through both solids and liquids. S waves, which starts with an S, can only go through solids. And remember, this is how we know about the interior of the Earth. We know that that inner core, the outer, I'm sorry, we know that that outer core is liquid because the S waves can't go through it. So knowing that, select the two statements that explain why fewer waves were recorded at some of the stations. Okay, moving on to the next question. The diagram shows a portion of a stream from above. Predict how the banks of the stream will change over time. Now remember, we talked about that streams get curvier. It's called a meander. So they start straight, but they gradually get curvier over time. So letter A says move an image into the blank box to show what bank A will look like over time. That's the bank on the top left corner. Then it says move a label into the box underneath the bank that describes the process occurring. So what is A going to look like? Is it going to be further eroded away or is there going to be more sediment piled up? You're going to pick the picture that you think represents what it will look like and then you're going to move one of those words into it. Now since you're not doing this on a computer, just kind of draw an arrow that points to what should go in those boxes. What's part A going to look like? What's the process that occurs that's causing that? And then for part B, Move an image into the blank box to show what bank B will look like over time. Move a label into the box underneath the bank that describes the process occurring. Again, show me what that bank is going to look like and show me what is the name of the process that causes that. And you see that bulleted point there. Use only one object in each blank box. Make sure anytime it gives you little extra notes like that that you pay special attention to what it's saying. Read everything before you try to answer that question. Go ahead and take a minute to answer it and then let's go on to the next question. Okay, this next one. Which two landforms are caused by convergent plate boundaries? Well, let's review really quick. Three types of plate boundaries. Convergent, come together, they collide. Divergent, divide, they separate. And then we have transform. Think of the S in transform. They slide past one another. Knowing that, what two landforms would be caused by a convergent plate boundary? That's a little bit of a hint right there. Okay, moving on to your next question. It says students investigate changes in gravitational potential energy using paper clips, paper, and shelves. They measure the masses of three paper clips and paper. They determine that the three paper clips have five times the mass of the piece of paper. Then they place the objects on the floor beneath the shelves. Now, it's important when you're reading this, pay special attention to the data that they give you in the paragraphs. The three paper clips have five times the mass of the piece of paper. Okay? So it says move the paper clips and the paper onto the shelves so that both have equal gravitational potential energy. Now, you're not going to be able to actually click and drag on anything, but you can use your arrow to uh, draw an arrow, use your pencil to draw an arrow to point to where it should be. So what you're looking for is how do I get the paper clips, which have five times as much mass, to have the same amount of gravitational potential energy as a piece of paper? Well, if you remember back to when we did physics, gravitational potential energy depends on the mass of the object and the height that it is. It also depends on the force of gravity, but since our gravity on Earth is going to be what's interacting on both of those, we really just need to pay attention to the mass and the height. So think about it. If it has five times as much mass, then what should the height be in order to equal something that is five times less mass? 
Figure out where you think the paper and the paper clips should go and draw your arrows. Okay, talking about gravity for this next question. It says an engineer is collecting data on four different satellites orbiting Earth. The engineer records the satellite's distances from Earth in kilometers and their forces due to gravity in newtons. And you can see that information that they recorded in the chart there. Estimate, so it means they're going to basically make a prediction, a guess. Estimate the values for two missing quantities. Enter your estimates into the blank boxes in the table. Now there's no equation that you're really going to use for this. You just have to think about how do I determine how much gravity there is? Well, it depends on the mass, first of all. The more mass I have, the more gravity I have. And it also depends on distance. The further away something is, the less the force of gravity is. So we take a look at satellite one. It has a mass of 700 kilograms and a distance of 4,000 kilometers from the Earth. So the force due to gravity is 1,700. Now, let's take a look at satellite two. It has the same mass as satellite one, but it has 36 thousand kilometers between it. So if that's going to be the same mass but a lot more distance between the two objects, do you think that force of gravity is going to be higher than satellite one or lower? Make your prediction, put it in there. Give a good estimate, a good number in there. Now for number three and number four, we can say they both have the same mass, 1,000, so we know they have more mass than satellite one and two, but Number four has 7,000 kilometers distance, meaning it has 80, meaning it has 8,100 newtons. Now satellite three has 11,000 newtons. So if it has a lot more gravity, but it has the same mass, what must it mean about its distance? Again, estimate the number and put it into the box. Okay, next question, talking about topographic maps. Now remember, topographic maps measure the elevation of the land, how high it is above sea level. The topographic map shows several features associated with the river, which is shown in blue. Part A, move into each blank box a landform label that identifies the feature sh shown. So take a look at the first box. Looks like it's kind of pointing to a bunch of circles together. Okay, so it would appear it's getting higher and taller. Think about what that would be. The second one is pointing to, well, on the screen you can see it's blue, but on your paper it's just that big, thick black line that runs to the ocean. And then in the third part, we see that line, which is headed towards the ocean, has dispersed a lot of, looks like, sediments. So think about what those three things would be and write those words in the box. Now for part B, it says move into each blank box a process label that identifies how the feature was formed. So for instance, when you look down there, you see underneath of landforms and processes, you see the word canyon, mountain, delta. Well, let's say you use one of those words. What I want you to tell me then is how did that canyon form? Or how did the mountain form? Or how did the delta form? And you're gonna tell me based on is it erosion, is it deposition, or is it plate movement? You only, if you take a look at the notes there, the two little points there, move only two labels into each box and you do not need to use all the labels. So again, since you're just writing this instead of clicking and dragging, you can just use your pencil to draw an arrow from the word to the box that it belongs. Next question, this should be an easy one. Which term is an example of a force? Think, a force is a push or a pull. And there's also types of non-contact forces, and there's types of contact forces. So which one of these, energy, mass, weight, or work, would be an example of a force? Next question. Two positively charged particles are attached to springs. A metal sphere is placed near each charged particle, as shown in the diagram. And if you take a look at the diagram there, you see interacting charges on setup A, we have a spring on the left there with a small positive charge, and then there's a larger positive charge also placed in that same box. On set at B, we have the spring that has the small positive charge, but this time we have a larger negative charge placed in that box. 
It says positive charge is slowly added to sphere A. An equal amount of negative charge is slowly added to sphere B. Assume the two systems are isolated from each other. So in other words, when you read that sentence, that means that the big positive charge, the big positive sphere, is not right next to the negative sphere in the other box. Okay, They're just putting them together for the sake of the diagram, but they are not anywhere near each other. So knowing that, how does the elastic potential energy change for each of the springs? So before you can answer this, you have to make sure that you know that opposite charges attract. So a north and a south pole attract, or a positive and a negative charge attract, and then like repel. So two positives would repel, two negatives would repel. So knowing that, how is the spring going to react when you have a small positive charge next to a big positive charge in set of A? How is the spring going to act in set of B, where you have a big negative charge next to a small positive charge? Are the springs going to get bigger, or are they going to condense down? If they're stretched more, they're going to have more elastic potential energy. And if they're compressed more, they're going to have more elastic potential energy. So knowing that, take a look and pick your best answer. Okay, moving on. It says, a scientist studies a newly discovered plant. Which question should the scientist ask to find out whether the plant reproduces sexually or asexually? Well, let's review two types of reproduction. In asexual reproduction, it only involves one organism, and the offspring look identical to the parent. In sexual reproduction, it involves two organisms, and the offspring is a mix of the DNA from those two parents. Knowing that, what would be the question that the scientist would have to ask to find out about how this plant reproduces? Okay, moving on, take a look. It says, as magma rises from the mid-ocean ridge, it cools and solidifies. As this magma solidifies, which again means it's becoming solid, it's hardening, some of the minerals align with Earth's magnetic field. Every few million years, Earth's magnetic field reverses. This reversal is recorded in the magma that solidified after leaving the mid-ocean ridge. In the picture, these magnetic reversals are indicated by dark and light bands. So let's take a look at this diagram and let's review what we've talked about before. It says magnetic orientation of ocean crust. I have seafloor spreading happening. The two plates are moving apart. As they move apart, okay, in a divergent boundary, the magma is popping up and it's cooling, okay? So it pops up, let's say it's gray right now, okay? It pops up, it cools, it pops up, it cools, and the gray starts getting further away as more magma pushes up. Well, then the magnetic field reverses. Now it represents the white color. So now I've got the gray bands that are out here and the whites in the middle and the white gets pushed as more magma pops up. Then the magnetic field reverses again, and now we have gray. So now gray is getting pushed up. So this is how we get that striped appearance on the sea floor. So the question is, how can scientists tell when the reversals of the magnetic field occurred? Knowing about what we just reviewed, answer this question. Okay, next question. Still talking again about ridges, seafloor spreading, divergent plate boundaries. They're all referencing the same thing. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge occurs at a divergent plate boundary where seafloor is spreading as shown in the diagram. And you see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge there, and you can see that there's a key for the different types of rocks. You've got ocean sediment, which is on top of the outer rocks over here, which would be the older. You've got igneous rock, which is normal polarity. Now that's talking about the magnetic field. You've got in the igneous rock, which is a reversed polarity. That's when that magnetic field reverses. And then you have the magma and the mantle material. And that's what's starting out underneath the plates and is eventually coming up in seafloor spreading. So the question says, in the diagram, the black dots with numbers represent radiometric ages in millions of years. So if we look at those black dots, we can see the ones closer to where the seafloor spreading is occurring. Those are 5 million years and 10 million years old. As we go out, they get to be 80 million years old and 100 million years old. It says the gray and white banding symbolizes the polarity of Earth's magnetic field as recorded in crystals within the igneous rocks that make up the seafloor. Gray represents normal polarity, and white represents reverse. It says, explain how two pieces of geologic evidence from the diagram support the hypothesis of seafloor spreading. 
Now on this picture here, it says type your answer in the space provided. Remember when you take this online, everything you do is going to be typed. But in this case, you're just gonna write. What are two pieces of evidence using this diagram that support the hypothesis of seafloor spreading? What's in this diagram that tells us that magma's pushing up, pushing the plates apart, and that the seafloor is constantly spreading? Take a minute, answer this in complete sentences, and then when you're ready, let's go on to the next question. Okay, for this next question, you can see this is one of those simulations that you're going to have to do on the test. It says an object has properties of charge, mass, and weight. The object is placed in an electric field. A student designs an experiment to determine the strength of the electric field. Place a label in each blank box to correctly identify the dependent and the independent variables in this experiment. And then you see the bulleted point there, place only one label in each blank box. Now let's review what is an independent variable and what is a dependent variable. This goes back to the beginning of the year when we started designing our own experiments. The independent variable, which starts with I, is the thing that I change. Each time I test it, this is what I am going to control. I'm going to change it. The dependent variable is what changes as a result of what the independent variable is. So we've got our four options there, charge, force, mass, and weight. Now we're only going to place one label in each box. So again, with your pencil, you can just draw an arrow to what should go in there. Let's look back up and see what this experiment is again to remind us. A student designs an experiment to determine the strength of the electric field. So we want to know what is the strength of the field. And we're going to change some things in order to measure this. Are we going to change the charge of that object? Are we going to change the force of the object? Are we going to change the mass of the object? Or are we going to change the weight of the object? What would we change? And then, that would be your independent variable. And then what will we measure? That will be the dependent variable. Take a minute to answer this, and then let's go on to the next question. Okay, here's another simulation, but this one's dealing with life science. It says four statements that describe cell division are shown. Place a label in the blank box next to each statement to identify which types of cell division it describes. Here's your bulleted points. Place only one label in each blank box, but you may use each label more than once. Okay, so you have to decide for each of these statements. Is it meiosis? Is it mitosis? Or is it both? Let's review really quick. The process of meiosis, me, it's how me formed, okay? I got 50% of my DNA from my mom, 50% from my dad. Those were formed through sex cells or gametes. So the process of meiosis produces those. They have half the number of chromosomes so that when they come together, I have a full set. Mitosis, remember, my toe, right? My toe, if I get a cut on my toe, the skin is going to have to repair itself on mitosis. And I want my skin cells to look identical to what they did before. So mitosis involves the process of reproducing new cells that look identical to what they did. Knowing this, which I've pretty much given you the answers now, I want you to go through and I want you to tell me, is it meiosis, mitosis, or both for each of these four statements? Okay, next question. It says a population of finches shows two beak types and three genotypes for the beak types. The finches seed diet is also shown. So let's take a look at what we see here. We've got the, the beak with the bigger, or the bird with the bigger beak. We've got big B and little B, big B, big B, and big B, little B. So we know that that big B is dominant. Again, big B's, big B, little B, big B, little B, whatever it is, those are the genotypes. Genotypes talks about the letters that it has. And it eats large seeds and nuts. Then we have the recessive. The genotype is little B, little B. The only way to see a recessive trait is with little letters, and it eats small, soft seeds. Now it says the environment in which the finches live changes to be very rainy and wet. In this environment, the large nuts and seeds are very scarce, but the small, soft seeds are plentiful. Click above the red lines. Now, you probably can't tell on your paper right now, but next to those big blue boxes on the bar graph is a little red dash, a little red line. If you were taking this, compute, this test online, you would click on that, and that would adjust the height of the red bar. It says, 
Click above the red lines on the graph to predict the change in the population's beak genotype if this environmental change continues for 100 years. Red bars will appear next to the blue bars when you click on the red line. So since you can't actually click on the red, what I want you to do is just draw a bar that represents what the new population will be like in this new environment where large nuts and seeds are scarce, but the small soft seeds are plentiful. And realize it says there may be more than one correct answer. Take a minute to answer this, and then we'll go on to the next question. Okay, now let's take a look at number 18. It says a battery-powered toy submarine is moving through water at constant speed and at a constant depth below the surface. The diagram shows a submarine with arrows representing the directions, but not the magnitudes of four forces acting on it. So when we look at this diagram here, submarine at constant speed, we see that the Q arrow is pointing up, S pointing down, R is pointing to the right, T is pointing backwards to the left. So let's talk about what these forces are. Okay, the Q force that would be holding the submarine up, that would be the buoyant force, the floating force. The S force that's acting opposite of that would be gravity. Now the R force, when it's moving forward, would be the thrust, just like on an airplane. But the T force would be drag, which is the friction caused by the water. So the question says, which conclusion can be made about the magnitudes of the forces acting on the submarine? So we want to know, another word for magnitude is strength. So what can we conclude about the strength of each of those forces if the submarine is moving at a constant speed and acting at a constant depth? Choose your answer, and then let's go on. Okay, number 19, it's dealing with Punnett squares. It says a chicken breeder has chickens that are white, black, or speckled. Speckled chickens ha have both black and white feathers. This is a co-dominant trait. Now, co-dominant, remember, that means that you see both of the letters, both of the alleles are represented. The allele for white feathers is FW, and the allele for black feathers is FB. Determine the genotypes for the rooster and hen that the breeder should cross to produce the greatest percentage, percentage of speckled chickens. So if we want inside of that Punnett square, the majority of all of them to be speckled chickens. We want 100% speckled chickens if we could get that, that's possible, which would be FW and FB, okay? Then what would the rooster's chromosomes be? What would their genes be? And what would the hen's genes be? What would their alleles be? And then what would the percent be? So letter A, it says place the alleles for the rooster and the hen that the breeder should cross in the blank boxes outside the Punnett square. Then letter B, place the number that shows the percentage of speckled offspring that will result from this cross in the blank box. Now if I were you, I recommend do the inside of the Punnett square first. If we want 100% of them to be speckled, then each one of those boxes would have what in it? Then, from there, you can figure out what the parents would be. And then from there, you can figure out what your percent would be, which hopefully you can get it to be 100% speckled. Look at the notes. It says you may use the allele labels more than once. There may be more than one correct answer. And place only one label in each blank box. Now, instead of drawing arrows, guys, I really would like you to write the letters in and write the number in of the Punnett square that you're able to get. Do that, and when you're ready, we'll go on to the next question. All right, question number 20. It says, the diagram represents a convection current in Earth's mantle. Descriptions of the events at each of the positions are shown. Move each number from the diagram to the blank box that describes the event occurring at the position in the convection current. So if you take a look there, now what you would normally do on your computer screen is you would drag the numbers down so that they match up with the boxes. But what you're going to do is you're going to write the numbers into the boxes. Let's review what a convection current is. Convection currents happen inside the mantle. They can either bring plates together, they can move plates apart, and it's the constant movement magma. The hot magma goes up because it's less dense, and the cool magma goes down because it's more dense. So using that knowledge, I want you to figure out what the convection currents are doing in this diagram. Put your numbers in the labels, and then we'll move on. 
Okay, the next one. The diagram shows a toy car on a track that is lying on the floor. And we see there we've got a toy car on a track with bumpers. Select the boxes to identify the net force for each stage of the car's motion. Now remember, net force means the total force. If forces are acting in opposite direction, we calculate the total by subtracting. If they're acting in the same direction, we calculate the total by adding. And if they're balanced, then the net force is zero. It doesn't mean it's not moving, it just means that the motion or the lack of motion is gonna continue. Balanced forces mean there won't be a change in motion. So what I need you to do is to put a check mark for each section that you see here, whether it's at rest, when it begins to move forward, when it moves at a constant speed, and when it slows down, what would be the net force? Would it be zero net force? Would the net force be acting up? Would it be acting to the right? Would it be acting down? Or would it be acting to the left? Put your check marks in, and then we'll go on to the next question. Okay, this next one's number 22. It says the geologist is investigating the history of an area that has experienced various geologic events, including sedimentation, erosion, tectonic deformation, and volcanic eruptions. The diagram shows the cross-section produced from her study. Now let's take a look at that diagram, and we can see that there's different layers. Remember, the law of superposition says the layer that's on the bottom in an undisturbed rock layer is always going to be the oldest. But this is not undisturbed. We can see that there's some folding that's perhaps gone on. We can see a magma intrusion. And remember, the law of cross-cutting relationships says that an intrusion is always younger than the layers it cuts through. Okay, so knowing that, says using the cross-section, explain how the geologist knows the relative age of the intrusion compared with that of the gravel. So I'm going to look at that intrusion, and I'm going to look at where the gravel is. How does the geologist know that the intrusion is either going to be older or younger compared to the gravel? How are they able to calculate that? Then the second part, explain how the geologist knows that the flow is older than the intrusion. So the flow, you can see there, it's labeled there at the bottom. How do we know that that is older than the intrusion? It says type your answer in here, but since again, we're doing this on pencil paper, go ahead and write your answer on, and then we'll go on to the next question. Okay, number 23. Four people return home from work and walk up the stairs to their own apartments in the same building. Which person has gained the most gravitational potential energy upon arriving at the door of his or her apartment? Now, when we talked about gravitational potential energy, the higher up it goes, the more gravitational potential energy it has. But what if they're at the same height? Which one has more? Well, the other thing that comes into play is mass. The more mass it has, the more potential energy it has. So knowing that, pick your answer, and then we'll move on. Okay, number 24, a gymnast performs on a trampoline. Figure one shows the gymnast at her lowest point. Figure two shows the gymnast at her highest point. Which table shows how gravitational and elastic potential energy change between figure one and two? So let's think about this. In figure one, she's not very high. She's down really low, and she stretched that trampoline to the max. So what would her gravitational potential energy be like? what would her elastic potential energy be like? Then in figure two, she's not stretching the trampoline anymore. The trampoline is no longer extended out, but she's really high in the sky. So she has the highest point of her jump. So what would her gravitational potential energy be like then? And what would her elastic potential energy be like? Take a minute to pick your answer. Okay, question number 25. A cell from a turkey's wing contains 40 chromosomes. How many chromosomes are there in an unfertilized turkey egg? So again, that egg cell, it's one of the sex cells that we talked about that would be formed through meiosis. How many chromosomes would be in that? Pick your answer. Okay, next question. What are the two sources of thermal energy in Earth's interior? Now, thermal energy refers to heat energy. So we want to think about inside the Earth. That's what that word interior means. What is inside the Earth that creates heat? This might be something that has to do with convection currents, if you think about it. Pick your answer. 
Okay, number 27. It says a car and two buses are driving on a highway. The blue arrows represent the direction and magnitude of each vehicle's motion relative to the ground. Now let's look at those blue arrows real quick before we go on. We see a car that has a pretty big blue arrow pointing to the left, a bus that has a smaller arrow pointing to the left, and another bus which has a small arrow pointing to the right. Your directions say place a red arrow or no motion label in each blank box to show the relative direction and magnitude of each vehicle's motion from the reference point of the car. So all of those blue arrows represent the reference point of the earth, what that vehicle is doing compared to the earth. But what you need to do with your red arrows is show me what are they doing in reference to the car. So if they're moving faster than the car, then it looks like they're getting further away from it, right? If they're moving the same speed as the car, then it's like they're not moving at all. If they're moving slower than the car, then the car is appearing to get further away from it. So you're comparing everything to the car. You're going to place only one arrow or label in each blank box. And it says you may use each arrow or label more than once. And for this one, guys, what I want you to do, it would normally be a click and drag type situation, but since we're paper pencil, just use your pencil to connect the arrow with the box that you would put it in. Number 28. This says several fish species became extinct millions of years ago. The graphs below show the distribution of fossils of these fishes as they occur in several undisturbed layers of sedimentary rock observable in a cliff face. So let's analyze these two graphs here first. Figure one on the left there. We have the y-axis, it's the frequency of fossils. Um, it says the number increasing. Okay, so as we get more fossils, it goes up higher. And on the bottom, we have the age of the rock layer. And as it's moving this way, it's getting younger. On figure one, it says fossil distribution is evidence of a sudden environmental change. But here it says, figure two, fossil distribution is evidence of a gradual environmental change. So in the first one, figure one, if you're paying attention, that was a sudden change. And in the second one, we have a gradual change. So here's your question. It says, explain why the distribution of the fossils in figure one supports the hypothesis that the extinction of species was a result of sudden environmental change. Why does that graph show you that it was a sudden environmental change? Then, describe an environmental change that could have produced this kind of fossil distribution. What could have been a sudden change that might have caused a lot of species to go extinct? On the second one, it says explain why the distribution of fossils in figure two supports the hypothesis that the extinction of the species was a result of gradual environmental change. And then again, for that one, describe an environmental change that could have produced this kind of fossil distribution. What's something that could have caused that gradual change? This is a four parts, four parts to this question, okay? Make sure you answer it all before you go on to the next one. Number 29, a geologist hiking through the woods in Ohio finds rocks containing fossils in a stream bank. The fossils look similar to animals currently living in the ocean. Which conclusion should the geologist make based on the discovery of these fossils? Guys, I'm not going to give you any hints on this one. I just want you to read the clues that are in the question and figure out why would the geologist find fossils that look similar to ones that were living in the ocean. Okay, number 30. One bar magnet sits on a table and a rubber band suspends another magnet above it. In the view on the left, the upper magnet is held in place and cannot move. In the view on the right, the upper magnet has been released. So let's take a look at these diagrams. Before it's released, just imagine somebody's there holding it. Okay, so the magnet on the left has not yet been dropped. The magnet on the right has been dropped and it has started moving down. How did the potential energy change when the upper magnet was released? So now we've got three types of potential energy that we're talking about here. We've got magnetic potential energy, the energy between poles that you see there, the north and the south. We have elastic potential energy when we're talking about the rubber band. And we have gravitational potential energy, meaning there's something suspended in the air that has the potential to fall. It has gravitational potential energy. So when we go from it being held before its release to all of a sudden after its release, what happens to each of these three types of potential energy? 
Choose your best bet and pick your answer. Okay, next one. I see uh, we've got a train box car here. And if we look at the picture up top there, it says on the left-hand side that it's going 100 kilometers per hour. And there's a person riding on that train. That shows the direction of motion is moving to the right. And then that person that's inside that car, it's still going 100 kilometers per hour, jumps up. So here's the question. A person is standing in the middle of a boxcar on a train moving 100 kilometers per hour. If the motion of the boxcar remains constant, where in the boxcar will the person most likely land after he jumps straight up? Now, remember that law of inertia. An object wants to keep doing what it's doing. So if it's not moving, it wants to keep not moving. If it's moving, it wants to keep moving, unless a force acts on it. So using that... I want you to see if you can figure out where he would land when he comes back down inside the boxcar. Okay, number 32. A scientist runs an electric current along a wire. A magnetic compass is placed near the wire. The scientist observes that whenever the current is turned on, the compass needle moves. Why does the compass needle move? Now we talked about what happens with electricity and magnetism and how they are related. So using that, I don't wanna give you too much information, I want you to use that to see if you can figure out what would be the correct answer. Why would a magnetic compass, whenever that current is turned on, why would the needle inside the compass move? Okay, question number 33 says the table describes several methods scientists can use to date rock layers and fossils. So let's take a look at what these dating methods are. First of all, method number one, it uses carbon from organic matter. It can determine the ages of rocks or directly from fossils. And it's used on samples that are up to about 100,000 years old. That is one way, one method to date rock layers and fossils. Method number two, it's used on samples that are more than 100,000 years old, and it determines the age of igneous rock. Now remember, igneous rock is those types of rocks that come out of a volcano. You guys learned that in uh, types of rocks in seventh grade. Number three, method number three. This uses the number and patterns of tree rings to find the age of the tree, and it's used on samples that are less than 11,000 years old. And then lastly, method four. This determines the last date that a sediment sample was exposed to sunlight. So those are the four ways that we can date rock layers and fossils. So here's your question. A geologist wants to date several samples. Descriptions are provided for each sample. That's what you see below. Because sampling can be expensive and time consuming, the geologist only wants to use the dating methods that are likely to provide a reliable date. So select the boxes to show all methods that can be used to date each sample. So there might be more than one method that could be used. That's how we know it. It says select the boxes to show all methods that can be used to date each sample. So you're going to determine which methods can we use for, first one, a deeply buried sample of limestone. Which methods could we use to date that? The next one, a piece of wood from a Native American cliff dwelling. The next one, a shallowly buried sample of shale that contains oyster and snail fossils. And then lastly, a dinosaur bone found in a sandstone layer that sits between two layers of basalt. Now I'm going to give you a clue. Basalt is an igneous rock. Okay. So knowing that, what would be the methods that you would use in order to date these four rock layers? Okay, number 34. Horizontal forces act on two boxes, initially at rest, as shown. The magnitude and direction of the horizontal forces are also shown. Now let's review that. Magnitude means strength, the strength of the force. And the longer the arrow is, the more force is being applied. So on box X, we can see there's a force being exerted on the left and on the right, both pushes. And the one on the left looks like it's longer. On box Y, there's one being put on the left and the right, and they look like they're about the same length, so it'd be the same magnitude. So what happens to box X and box Y as a result of these forces? Read your options and pick your best answer. 
Okay, now for this next one, this is something that you would do on the computer where you would actually click on a part of the graph. Um, so for this, I want you to use your pencil to circle. It says the graph shows the behavior of primary waves during an earthquake. Click on each region of the graph where seismic waves entered different layers of Earth's interior. So now we, we talked about that the Earth has different layers. We've got the crust, the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. Some of those are solids. Some of those are liquids. And as the P waves and S waves move through them, they behave differently. So what I want you to do is to circle the areas based on the graph where that P wave enters a new area, a new layer, which means it's probably going to start moving differently. Okay, you've got the speed on your Y axis and you have depth on the X axis. So take a minute now to circle the area or areas where the P wave uh, shows that the seismic wave enter a different layer. Okay, question number 36. A basket of apples is pulled with a constant force. A friction force acts in a direction opposite to the motion. The basket starts at rest and it increases its speed over time. So it's getting faster. You can see there, looking at the diagram, the force is acting on the basket. We've got pulling to the right and we've got friction acting on it to the left. Click on, or since we can't click on anything, I want you to circle each action that will reduce the rate at which the speed of the basket changes. So of those things that you see there underneath of actions, I want you to circle any of them that are going to change the speed at which the basket um, is moving, okay? The rate at which the speed of the basket is changing. So of those things I want you to do, I want you to look at that list under actions, and I want you to circle anything that is going to decrease that rate at which the speed of the basket changes. Take a minute to circle those before we move on to the next question. Okay, number 37. It says a scientist is studying a chemical reaction. She predicts that after the reaction, the products will have less chemical potential energy than the reactants had originally. So remember that chemical potential energy is kind of like in food. When I eat food, I digest it and I release that chemical potential energy. I turn it into other types of energy. So this scientist is going to predict that after her reaction that the products that she produces will have less chemical potential energy than what she started with. The scientist observes the reaction and notes that no light or sound is produced. However, other observations support the scientist's prediction that the total chemical potential energy has decreased. Describe one observation that would support her prediction. Now, it says to type your answer, but again, you're going to write this. Think about chemical potential energy. What is one way that we would know that what we started with in our chemical reaction and then what we have left in the end, how would we know that that chemical potential energy was somehow transferred to another type of energy? Think of the types of energy that are out there. No light, no sound was produced, but what else could have been produced that would cause us to know that chemical potential energy was converted into another type of energy? Write your answer down. Number 38, mountains often form along tectonic plate boundaries. Identify one type of tectonic plate boundary that forms mountains. Then explain what happens along the boundary to cause the formation of mountains. So again, we talked about those three types of plate boundaries, the ones that collide, the ones that divide, and the ones that slide. Knowing what those are, okay, think of those three types. So which one of those can form mountains? And then explain what is happening along that boundary that would cause the mountains to form. Write your answer below. Okay, now on question 39 through 41, you're going to see sometimes a series of questions that all involve one key picture or one key diagram or one key simulation. In this case, we have a picture and we have a simulation, and that's what you see at the top of the page there. It says a farmer grows flowering bushes. The bushes have red, white, or red and white flowers. Select two parents to cross and then click start. The number of offspring with each flower color will be shown. So what this is going to show you is this is going to show you how many of the offspring would be red, how many would be white, or how many would be red and white. And again, that red and white thing, that's that co-dominant feature where the red isn't dominant, the white isn't dominant, they're both dominant. And so when they mix, you see red and white. So 
if this were a computer, you would be able to, for parent one, change it to red flowers or white flowers or red and white. Same thing for parent two. Then you would hit start. And then you would be able to type in, or it would pop up for you automatically, the information of how many flowers for each of those. Now, you obviously don't have to do anything with that because you can't really click on anything right now, but I just wanted you to see that they'll give you simulations like this and they'll give you images like this to help you with the next questions. So let's take a look at that first question then that we do have to answer. It says, use the simulation to perform an investigation to determine the flower color genotype for each flowering bush parent. Now remember, genotypes are the letters, the actual alleles. Place the alleles in the blank boxes to show the genotype for each parent. It says place only one allele in each box. You may use each allele more than once, and you do not need to use all the alleles. Now we can see on the left-hand side there, we've got a big R, a little r, a big W, and a little w. Knowing what we've talked about, I want you to go in right now, and I want you to write what would be the genotype for the red flowers parent, the white flowers parent, and the red and white flowers parent. And remember, if you were to be doing this on a computer and you were to click and drag, let's say the capital R to a place where you didn't want it, you would click on the blue delete button, then click over onto that piece that you didn't want, the capital R, and it would disappear. Then in order to go back to the pointer mode, you would have to click on the little arrow that's next to the delete button. Don't forget that key, okay? Go ahead and take a minute to answer this before you go on to question number 40. Okay, question number 40, it says, in the table, place the correct number of cells containing the appropriate genetic information that would result from the process of mitosis for a bush with red and white flowers. So think about what mitosis is, my toe, okay? What's the cell in the end gonna look like? Is it gonna look like what it started out with or is it going to be different? Think about what mitosis is and choose, and you can just draw an arrow, which one of those five circles that you see the circles there with the chromosomes in it, which one of those five um, would be representative of what happens in mitosis? Which one of those cells would have the correct number of chromosomes? For B, it says in the table, place the correct number of cells containing the appropriate genetic information that would result from the process of meiosis for a bush with red and white flowers. Again, same red and white flowers, but this time we're doing the process of meiosis. What would that final cell look like? And it says you may use some of the cells more than once. You may not need to use all of the objects. Go ahead and take a minute to do that, and then we're on to the last question. Okay, question number 41. It's a simulation again for the uh, Punnett squares. It says use the simulation to cross a red flowering bush and a red and white flowering bush. Okay, so we have a red is one parent and red and white is the other parent. Place the alleles into the blank boxes to fill in the Punnett square for this cross. Here's the key points here. Place only one allele in each box. You may use each allele more than once. There may be more than one correct answer, and you do not need to use all of the alleles. So we've got a big R, a little r, a big W, and a little w. But remember, we talked about that these red and white flowers are showing co-dominance. So think about what that means. Do I need the recessive alleles or not? Do the cross, and uh, then when you're ready, go ahead and click play. All right, guys, so that about does it. We've gone through all the sample questions that they've put up on the website for us to be able to look at. We're gonna go over the answers to all of this in the next coming class. So make sure that you get this finished. Make sure you've watched the whole video. If you need to go back and check on any of them, you can do that. You can just scroll along to find the number that you need. And then make sure you have all those answered. Bring those into class with you, and we'll go over all the answers together. You guys are gonna do great on this test. I can't wait.